Welcome, my name is Kristen and I'm a California State Park interpreter filming here at the Oceano Dunes State Vehicular Recreation Area. Now behind me you are seeing a beautiful dune landscape and today students we are going to discover the animals that call this dune habitat home, how these dunes are formed and so much more. What do you say students would you like to join me on today's adventure in discovering these dunes? Well before we dive deeper into this topic let's take a 360 tour of these coastal sand dunes. Now that we've gotten a view of these dunes, are you curious as to how all the sand got here and how these dunes are formed? Well, those are really two important questions that we're gonna explore and learn about today. But before we dive deeper into this topic, let's look at a map to see where exactly these dunes are located. These coastal sand dunes are located in North America. But let's zoom in a little closer to see which state these dunes are located. These coastal sand dunes are located off the coast of California along the Pacific Ocean, where you see the blue dot. Students, let's zoom just a little closer to see if we can capture an aerial view of these coastal sand dunes. Do you notice the tan color along the coast? Well, you are seeing the sand dunes I am filming at today, located in Oceano, California. Now that we have our sense of place and location for these coastal sand dunes, let's learn how sand becomes sand and how these dunes are formed. California's landscape is quite diverse with a variety of ecosystems and landforms. Today our journey to learn how sand dunes are formed begins amongst the largest landform found in California, which are mountains. When we take a look at this topographic map of California, we can see the large mountain ranges which stretch over 800 miles of land in California and run parallel to the Pacific Ocean. Mountain ranges are formed by layers of cooled magnum rock, which is also called igneous rock. Rivers and streams form around large granite and sandstone boulders, making up the landscape of mountain ranges in California. Large rocks are found along mountain ranges, where they stay nestled amongst the rocky cliffs for season after season, until they are moved by a natural force. These forces can include weather events like rain or melting snow. And with the help of gravity's force, these rocks move throughout the mountains by way of rocky streams, waterfalls, and river rapids. As rocks travel through moving water and brush up against other rocks, these rocks begin to break down into smaller and smaller pieces, taking part in a process called weathering. Eventually, these smaller rocks find their way to calmer waters and make their way to the beach by way of a creek along the shore. Ocean waves bring the now tiny sand particles, which remember started out as larger rocks up in the mountains. These tiny sand particles are washed out to the ocean where they settle just offshore, creating what is known as sandbars. These sandbars sit in fairly shallow water where sand particles become even smaller through the force of the crashing waves. These waves will then bring the tiny sand particles back to the beach where they will make their final journey to form sand dunes. When will carry the tiny sand particles to help form new and existing sand dunes. That's quite the process for rocks to turn into sand and for sand to eventually form these coastal sand dunes. Now this coastal sand dune habitat that I'm standing at today did not form overnight. It actually took quite a bit of time for it to form and can be measured on geological timescales. Now before we take a closer look at this coastal dune habitat, let's take a step back to the beginning where rocks become sand by taking a closer look at the weathering process. Weathering occurs when the cracks of large rocks and boulders collect water from weather events such as rain or melting snow. Over time, the water expands inside the rock, and as water expansion increases, the boulder breaks apart into smaller rocks. Eventually, the force of the water carries these rocks in a process called erosion. Rocks move throughout the mountain by way of rivers, streams, and waterfalls. As rocks move through the mountain and the watershed, they will continue to weather into tinier and tinier pieces along the way until eventually becoming grains of sand that make their way to the ocean. 
What happens to sand once it reaches the ocean? Well, certain conditions need to be in place to create the perfect environment to form coastal sand dunes. To get a better idea of this, let's take a look at a map highlighting the coastline of these dunes. As we take a look at this map focusing on the coastline, let's locate the Oceano Dunes, which is the purple pin. Let's follow the coastline north towards the red pin where it states Point San Luis. We just outlined the low-lying stretch of coastline that faces the wind and makes a unique fish hook or upside down J shape. This unique shape and positioning of the coastline helps form these coastal sand dunes. Let's continue looking at the map and take a look at the location of the Arroyo Grande Creek. Remember, this creek opens to the beach and brings sand to the ocean. Ocean currents carry the sand parallel to the coastline until waves bring the sand back up to the beach. What happens when sand reaches the beach? Once the sand is brought back to the beach, the sun will dry the grain of sand and then wind will put these sand grains in motion through a process called wind erosion. Let's take a look at a few graphics to explain the movement of sand. Sand movement occurs through three different types of wind erosion, which are surface creep, saltation, and suspension. Let's take a closer look at how sand grains move, beginning with surface creep. Surface creep occurs when wind pushes heavier grains across the surface. These sand grains are too heavy to be lifted by the wind, but rather collide with other sand grains along the surface. The next type of wind erosion process is called saltation, which makes up for the largest movement of sand grains. During saltation, the wind lifts sand grains just above the surface where they continue to bump up and down along the sand surface, forming ripples in the sand. The final wind erosion process is called suspension, when a sand grain is lifted and blown into the air. During suspension, the airborne sand grain will continue to fly with the wind until hitting an obstacle such as vegetation or an existing sand dune. Let's continue learning about sand movement and take a closer look at how sand grains move once they hit an obstacle of an existing sand dune. In this graphic, we can see wind pushing sand up along the windward side of the dune. The sand will pile up to the summit, which is the top of the dune, until it collapses down the leeward side of the dune. This movement of sand creates a hill of sand. In this video, you can see the top of the dune collapsing down the leeward side. Dunes will eventually become too steep at the top and sand will start to slip away from the slope, creating a slip face. As the sand continues to fall to the bottom, it creates what is called a bowl. Sand dunes are of varying sizes and are always changing. Some dunes are smaller, some are taller, some are wider, and some are steeper. A sand dune doesn't stay the same height or size for its entire existence. Sand dunes are constantly changing as the wind continues to move and bring more sand to the dune environment. The formation of these coastal sand dunes is amazing and takes time. Now just like the time it takes to form these dunes, the animals that call this habitat home have also learned over time how to survive in this dune habitat through adaptations. So let's take a closer look at what an adaptation means. An adaptation is a process of change in which a species becomes better suited for its environment. Let's begin with one of my favorite animals who has learned to survive and adapt in this coastal dune habitat called the kangaroo rat. Kangaroo rats have adapted to survive in the sandy, windy, and little to no rain dune environment through a variety of adaptations. Kangaroo rats have learned over time of how to adapt to survive in this environment. Let's learn about a few of the adaptations of the kangaroo rat by beginning with the adaptation of not needing to drink fresh water. It certainly can be a challenge finding fresh drinking water in the dune environment due to the very little rainfall that occurs during certain months of the year. However, the kangaroo rat has adapted to not need drinking water, but rather obtain moisture from seeds. Seeds are important to the kangaroo rat because they not only fulfill their hunger, but also hydration. To better understand this adaptation, let's take a look at another adaptation of the kangaroo rat, which is the behavior of burrowing. Kangaroo rats burrow underground to provide protection from the elements of this dune habitat and also a place to store seeds. Kangaroo rats are nocturnal and gather seeds at night, hopefully when predators are asleep. Once kangaroo rats gather seeds, they will store them in their cheeks before bringing them back to their underground burrow. Now let's return to the adaptation of not needing drinking water. 
Seeds gathered by kangaroo rats are stored underground and are like sponges in a sense, absorbing all the moisture that kangaroo rats need to stay hydrated. Through this adaptation, kangaroo rats do not need to drink water, but rather eat seeds full of moisture. Let's explore one more adaptation of the kangaroo rat. To understand this adaptation, I'd like for you to think of what a kangaroo is good at. If you are thinking jumping, you are correct. Now, I want you to think about the name kangaroo rat, and I want you to think what they also might be good at. If you are thinking jumping again, you are correct. Kangaroo rats are excellent jumpers. They can jump up to heights of nine feet to escape predators such as snakes. I am about five feet, eight inches tall, so kangaroo rats could definitely jump over me. Now, how do kangaroo rats jump so high? Well, their bodies have adapted over time. Kangaroo rats can jump incredible heights by tucking in their front legs and using the force of their large hind legs to jump. Once they are set in motion, their elongated tail acts like a steering wheel. The kangaroo rat has some pretty impressive adaptations to help them survive in the dune habitat. Let's take a look at another animal who has learned to survive in this dune environment. First look, you might be thinking this animal is a snake. Well, this animal is an imposter in a sense, and is not a snake at all, and is considered a lizard. This animal named the legless lizard can be found living amongst these coastal sand dunes. However, what makes this animal a lizard when it looks so much like a snake? Well, two characteristics of this animal make it a lizard and not a snake. The first characteristic is legless lizards have eyelids that open and close, while snakes do not have eyelids at all. Lastly, the legless lizard can detach its tail to confuse predators, which is a skill snakes cannot do. Legless lizards are considered reptiles, and in order for reptiles to regulate their body temperature, they use their environment rather than using their metabolism like mammals. Legless lizards have adapted to survive in the coastal sand dune environment by regulating their body temperatures through the behavior of burrowing. Legless lizards burrow just underneath the sandy soil, and typically under shrubs found in this dune environment, such as California sagebrush, mock heather, and coyote brush. These shrubs provide a good amount of leaf litter, which helps keep temperatures low and moisture high. And insects are attracted to these shrubs due to their expansive root systems, providing legless lizards ample food to forage on, such as beetles, spiders, and other insects. Burrowing creates the just right conditions for legless lizards who spend most of their lives just under the sandy soil. It's quite amazing how animals have adapted to survive in this dune environment. We're gonna take a look at another type of animal that calls this habitat home, and they are birds. Now we see several bird sightings here in this dune environment, and today we're gonna to talk about two special birds who face some challenges here. And these two birds are the threatened western snowy plover and the endangered California leastern. You may have noticed how I used the words endangered and threatened before the names of these birds. Well, we're gonna take a closer look at what it means to be a threatened and endangered species. A threatened species is likely to become endangered. An endangered species is at risk of becoming extinct, and extinct species no longer exist. First, let's take a closer look at the western snowy plover. The western snowy plover species range spans along the Pacific coast of the United States. The location of these birds extends all the way north to the state of Washington and south to Baja, California. Western snowy plovers are considered shorebirds, which means they prefer a habitat near the beach. When we think of birds making nests, we often think of birds building nests up in trees. However, the western snowy plover prefers to build their nests on the sandy ground of the foredune area of the beach. The foredune habitat is located higher up above the shoreline, consisting of drier sand and open space among smaller sized dunes. Let's get a bird's eye view of the nesting area of the western snowy plover and learn more about their nesting habitat. During the breeding season from March to September, nests of western snowy plovers called scrapes are found along the shore. These nests are located along the sandy surface among washed up kelp called rack. Nests are made from ocean debris such as driftwood, rocks, and shells. Since these nests are on the sandy surface and use material found along the nesting habitat, 
These nests are built to blend in with their environment, so they are hopefully invisible to predators and lessen the chance of a predator finding the one to three eggs located in the nest. Additionally, western snowy plovers are not very large birds, measuring only about six inches. Therefore, it is very important for these birds during the nesting season to reserve their energy for protecting the eggs of the nest. Both female and male western snowy plovers protect the nest by sitting on the eggs during the incubation period. This period can last for about 26 to 33 days. After a successful incubation period, the newly hatched and born chicks are already foraging on food such as insects and small crustaceans along the shore within hours of being born. However, during the incubation period, the western snowy plover faces a few challenges in the successful hatching of eggs during the nesting period. For example, if an adult snowy plover who is sitting on eggs to provide protection becomes distracted from an approaching predator or sees a dog or a human, it can either run away from the nest or take flight, causing the bird to lose precious energy and allowing the nest and eggs to become vulnerable to an attack by predators. The nesting habitat is located along the beach where humans enjoy recreating and also the nesting season falls within the summer months when many people gather at the beach to play and relax. Therefore, the balance of protection and recreation is important for the population growth of the western snowy plover species. However, there are a few ways this habitat can be protected. Let's discover how and why this habitat is protected. Currently, the western snowy plover is listed as a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Here at the Oceano Dunes District, field staff protects the nesting habitat by forming fences around the nest locations and areas used by the western snowy plover. Additionally, field staff will closely monitor western snowy plovers and their nests. There are also ways we humans can help western snowy plovers. When visiting the beach where western snowy plovers nest, we can read and follow posted signs. If you do see a western snowy plover on the beach, give them lots of space. Additionally, pick up your trash. Trash left at the beach can attract animals who can be predators, and keep your dogs on leash. Lastly, fly kites in areas where allowed. Western snowy plovers often confuse kites for large predatory birds. With all of our help, hopefully the western snowy plover population will increase for future generations. Let's discover another shorebird that also prefers to nest along the beach called the California least tern. California least terns are an endangered species who nest on the coast of California. They are seasonal birds who spend their time along the California coast from April to September for the breeding and nesting seasons. The nesting habitat locations of these birds span from San Francisco to Baja, California. During the winter months, they will leave California for locations in Central and South America. Just like the western snowy plover, these birds also build nests on the sandy shore. California least terns prefer nesting habitats located along the beach in open spaces and away from vegetation. Nests are constructed with ocean debris such as pebbles and shells and typically hold two eggs. California least terns build nests in colonies with other California least terns. A typical colony is about 25 pairs of California least terns. Both male and female California least terns will protect the nest during the incubation period, which typically lasts 20 to 25 days. Why are California least terns considered endangered? Well, in the 1970s, the California least tern population was incredibly low, and there was concern if the population of the species declined further, they could become extinct. Habitat loss is one of the main reasons to their population decline. Many homes, businesses, and roadways have been built along the coast of California for many years and have been built in areas where California least terns prefer to nest. Also, humans who visit the beach enjoy recreating in the same places California least terns nest, which can cause damage to the nest and the nesting habitat area. Therefore, in 1970, the California least tern was listed on the Federal Endangered List and listed on the California Endangered List in 1971. Through the efforts of many, the California least tern populations are becoming healthier and hopefully will continue to grow for future generations. And remember, we can do our part when we visit the beach by keeping pets on leash, picking up our trash, and following posted signs. 
It sure has been amazing learning about these dynamic dunes and how sand becomes sand and how these dunes are formed and learning about the adaptations of the animals who call this habitat home and also learning about habitat restoration. I hope you enjoyed this program as much as I did. And until next time, this is Kristen. For more information on this topic, please visit our social media pages and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And teachers interested in reserving a spot for your class to attend a virtual field trip to the Oceano Dunes SVRA, please visit www.ports-ca.us. Links are available in the description.